Section thirty eight of Claimants to Royalty. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Claimants to Royalty by John H. Ingram. The False Princess of Cumberland, England. The Pretended Princess of Cumberland, England. 1866 of all the wild stories which have been concocted by pretenders to regal lineage none that has obtained any public notice has been so utterly absurd in its developments as that told by lavinia janetta horton reeves in eighteen sixty six this individual the daughter of mr sayres an artist and the wife of a mr reeves actually brought her claim to be recognized as princess of cumberland into a court of law according to the statement which mrs reeves made through her counsel and which indeed was only a recapitulation of what had already appeared in various periodicals her grandmother olive had been married to the duke of cumberland brother of george the third and had had the marriage acknowledged by that monarch this statement was supported by several documents purporting to be signed by king george and several other persons of exalted position but which were characterized by the prosecution of impudent forgeries the production apparently of mrs sayres and the jury would seem to have taken the same view of their nature the story in extenso was this the rev dr james wilmot of barton on the heath warwickshire met and became enamoured of the sister of count poniatowski subsequently king of poland dr wilmot married this polish lady but in order to retain his fellowship kept the marriage a profound secret one child olive a very beautiful girl was the sole issue of this love match when this lovely daughter was seventeen years of age she was seen at a nobleman's house by the duke of cumberland fallen in love with and after a very brief courtship married by the prince this marriage which was alleged to have been celebrated by the bride's father dr wilmot on march fourth seventeen sixty seven was also a secret one on the third of april seventeen seventy two a daughter christened after her mother olive was born of this clandestine union but previous to the interesting event the duke of cumberland availing himself of this secrecy of his first marriage actually committed bigamy by taking unto himself a second wife in the person of lady anne horton sister of the infamous colonel luttrell the second olive according to the testimony of the claimant was first baptized as daughter of the duke of cumberland and then by command of george the third in order to preserve her royal father from the penalty of bigamy was again baptized at another church as the daughter of robert wilmot dr wilmot's brother and anna maria his wife a certificate of this effect was produced purporting to be signed by the two wilmot brothers and the earl of warwick and as means of the child olive's future identification it was certified that she had a large mole on the right side and another crimson mark upon the back near the neck the so-called princess of cumberland died in france on the fifth of december seventeen seventy four and according to dr wilmot's supposed certificate in the prime of life of a broken heart evidently caused by her royal husband's desertion of her george the third was perfectly cognizant of his brother cumberland's union with olive wilmot and was therefore deeply indignant at his heartless behaviour but as according to another portion of the claimant's story he had contracted a similar bigamous union himself he was necessarily compelled to keep quiet about the occurrence however in order to compensate his little niece in some way for her loss of birthright he not only allowed her putative parents five hundred pounds per annum for her support but placed in their hands the following acknowledgment of her claims to royalty Quote, george r we hereby are pleased to create olive of cumberland duchess of lancaster and to grant our royal authority for olive our said niece to bear and use the title and arms of lancaster should she be in existence at the period of our royal demise 
given at our palace of st james may seventeenth seventeen seventy three chatham j dunning End quote. when about seventeen this duchess of lancaster and petto came to london and made the acquaintance of john thomas sayers proprietor of the coburg theatre and son of a royal academician upon the first of september seventeen ninety two this descendant of the sovereigns of england and poland was married to mr sayers but as might be anticipated the union was not a very happy one and in eighteen o three a separation took place of the four children who were issue of this marriage two daughters grew up one of whom lavinia born in seventeen ninety seven remained with her mother whilst the other went with her father mrs sayers who became an author and artist and published a book to prove that the letters of junius were written by dr james wilmot would appear to have been somewhat crazed at least towards the latter part of her life she assumed the title of princess of cumberland and brought up her daughter lavinia in the belief that she was of royal lineage dr wilmot who died in eighteen o seven at the advanced age of eighty-five was supposed to have left his daughter the following remarkable document quote, my dear olive as the undoubted heir of augustus king of poland your rights will find aid of the sovereigns that you are allied to by blood should the family of your father act unjustly but may the great disposer of all things direct otherwise the princess of poland your grandmother i made my lawful wife and i do solemnly attest that you are the last of that illustrious blood may the almighty guide you to all your distinctions of birth mine has been a life of trial but not of crime j wilmot january seventeen ninety one end quote. it was not until eighteen fifteen according to the evidence given by mrs reeves at the trial that her mother knew anything of her royal parentage she having been brought up in the belief that she was the daughter of robert wilmot dr wilmot's brother when the wonderful information was conveyed to her through the instrumentality of the earl of warwick she took the title of princess and so said the witness was even acknowledged by the duke of kent and other members of the royal family as a relative the duke of kent so it was alleged even granted to the soi disant princess one-third of his canadian estates binding himself his heirs and executors to a solemn observance of the covenant and promised to see her reinstated in her royal rights in eighteen eighteen he further bound himself his heirs executors and assigns according to the claimant's story to pay the princess olive an annuity of four hundred pounds and this annuity so it was averred was duly paid until the duke's demise after which event it was not continued indeed such trust did the duke of kent repose in the princess olive if the documents produced might be relied on that he constituted her guardian of his daughter alexandrina our present majesty and directress of her education on account of her relationship and because the duchess of kent was not familiar with english modes of education out of respect for a mother's feelings the princess olive as her daughter explained did not attempt to execute this desire of her deceased cousin of kent so thoroughly were the princess olive's royal claims ventilated that it is averred she was entertained at the civic banquet at the guild hall on the ninth of november eighteen twenty and permitted or invited by the lord mayor alderman thorpe to occupy one of the seats usually assigned to members of the royal family in eighteen thirty four the putative princess otherwise mrs sayers died leaving her claims as an inheritance to her daughter lavinia janetta horton then the wife of mr anthony thomas reeves and the mother of several children the personal appearance of mrs reeves so believers in her claims asserted was greatly in favor of her alleged descent from the royal family but unfortunately for her pretensions neither judge nor jury would admit such supposed resemblance as evidence in replying on the remarkable statements made at the trial 
the attorney general ruthlessly demolished the whole fabric of the cumberland romance he did not impute aught to mrs reeves more than that having brooded over the matter for so many years she had at last persuaded herself of the truth of the fiction she was representing but mrs sayers he suggested was really the concocter of the whole scheme true it was contended sir rundell palmer that the petitioner's mother mrs sayers was not quite responsible for her actions so many of them having been of an ultra eccentric character he described several of her crazy words and deeds and showed how she had varied her tale from time to time at first only claiming to be an illegitimate scion of the royal stock and first making claims to regal legitimacy in a time of great public agitation at the period of queen caroline's trial indeed said the attorney-general a revolution was threatened by the deceased claimant if her pretensions were not recognized within a few hours the jury were unanimous and immediately pronounced against the claims of the petitioner mrs reeves whose wonderful documents and marvellous certificates were all ordered to be impounded since that trial the claims of mrs reeves and her offspring appear to have passed into oblivion end of the false princess of cumberland england